Hey there, welcome to the latest live edition of the Winter Circle presented by Naira and Naira Bets, the official online betting partner of the Belmont Stakes and Saratoga Racecourse. I'm Bram Weinstein. That is Dan Torgman from America's Best Racing. What's up, Dan? How was your weekend? Good, good. Pretty low key. Um, just kind of taking it easy for multiple <laughs> yeah. reasons. <laughs> hanging in there, just hanging in there. Yeah. Just hanging in. It was a good weekend to, to kind of just lay it low. Got a couple of big weekends ahead of us with, uh, I mean, at least in our world, I mean, the racing world, you got Pacific Classic this weekend coming up, uh, big racing at Del Mar. And then, of course, yeah. next weekend, not this weekend, but next weekend, you got, you got Traverse at uh, Traverse Weekend at Saratoga. So I'm pumped. I'm, I'm just trying to reserve my energy, trying to stay composed. And you, you've got some deep, you know, some stuff going on in your world, right? A little bit. We just had a we had a football game for the first mm -hmm. time. We had a preseason football game up in New England. Washington took on New England. We got the Bengals Friday night. Then I'll be with you on Saturday for big race day. Big race day. So we'll get into that. Um, but yeah, no, I, I laid low too. This was a good weekend for me to lay low this past weekend. Yeah. So laid low. Things ramp up again. All right, let's get into some racing from the past weekend. Let's start with the four star Dave. Um, as we had a little bit of history occur in it and a surprise happen in it. So check out the stretch called the four-star day from Saratoga. Field is at the top of the stretch. Here is Whispernaut up to challenge blowout for the lead. Got Stormy ranges up on the outside. It is Got Stormy who has now come away with the lead. Got Stormy is in front as they come down for the 16th pole. She's in front here by two. A late run on the outside from set piece. But Got Stormy has won the grade one. Four star Dave handicap. And she completes the mile on the inner turf in one minute. 33 seconds. It's two Emmys. Third longest <laughs> shot on the board there, Dan. Third longest shot on the board of an eight-horse field. Um, mm -hmm. Second win in this race, but it's been a couple of years since she won it the first time, so pretty interesting conclusion. Yeah, I mean, you know, we overthink this stuff sometimes. I see Stephen Winos in the, uh, in the comments, uh, and he's a part owner with the My Racehorse team. Uh, so they had a big day Saturday with God Stormy. But we overlook things. We're like, oh, you know, at this distance and, and over this kind of surface. And this, like, God Stormy was second in this race last year, won it in 2019, won the De La Rose before that at Saratoga, obviously loved the track was obviously going to get a dream trip in behind some speed. And she showed up with her A game again, uh, six years old, doesn't matter. Uh, and it is pretty incredible to have um, a mayor like this, you know, taking on the boys, beating them for the second time in this race. It's just, it, it really is. It, it, it's, it's one of the rarities in racing. It's hard to explain to people who don't watch racing. It's, you know, if you have like, uh, you know, a, a female athlete taking on male athletes um, in a race that, again, I mean, predominantly is won by male athletes and having her win it two times now in three years and at an age that is a little advanced. I mean, some of the mares, the female horses, do get better with age as, as they go into their five-year-old season. But as a six-year-old to come back and do this for the second time in three years, truly really remarkable. Yeah, it is. It's pretty wild. And uh, let's see, Get Stormy won this race, I don't know, 10, 11 years ago. Got Stormy's now won it twice, but... Typically, when you see that it's back to back years, that didn't even happen here. So it's yeah. pretty bizarre. I mean, it's really, it's a really wild, bizarre result that they got over the weekend. Yeah, for sure. The, the other interesting horse here, I mean, because there is, you know, there's a whole race here. I think you want to take things out of this race moving forward as we look toward the Breeders' Cup. You have a horse like Set Piece, who we watched live uh, about, what, a month ago? Yeah. We won the Wise Dan. Um, I want him moving forward out of this race. He, again, squeezed at the start, dropped way too far back, made the widest move of all, and um, was really the only one making up ground late. Um, I don't think was really going to get to, to God Stormy, but uh, at least made a significant move um, if from a compromised position. So uh, for me, set piece, interesting horse moving forward. Yeah, that was a cool one. All right, one other race I want to get to from over the weekend, and it may be the last that we have at Arlington Park, which is used to be the Arlington Million, now known as the Mr. D. So check out the stretch call of the Mr. D from outside of Chicago. 
Bradbury looms to the home team. It's two innings at the turn in from Busy Channel. Domestic spending Zulu Alpha. Then counting up the inside. Armory Space Traveler. Strong tide tailed off. There's one for long to go. And long odds. Two innings is still there. Domestic spending is charging hard. They come past the 16th. Two Emmys clings on. Domestic spending on the outside. Giving us a finish to remember. Two Emmys. Two Emmys pulls it off at 27 to 1. Held domestic spending and the Mr. D stinks. All right. So we had 10 to 1 up at the four star day. We got 27 to 1 here hanging on uh, beating domestic spending. It was big, heavy favorite in that race. All right. There's a lot more to this that I want to get to with you, but just do you have a reaction to the race in itself first? Yeah, quick reaction to the race is all the credit to James Graham, who time and time will do this, one of the most underrated turf riders in the country for the past like 10, 15 years maybe, gets to the front with the horse, slows it down. Uh, two Emmys took zero pressure, went a half in almost 53 seconds, three quarters and a minute 16 and change. doesn't matter who the horse is. When you're racing at this level and you're going that slow and no one's putting pressure on you, they're not going to catch you. Um, not even domestic spending, who still ran an incredible race to get as close as he did uh, with no pace. Um, I know we're also going to talk about Flavian Pratt in a little bit. Um, would have liked to have seen him have domestic spending a little closer to the front end since they were going that slow. But that being said, um, you know, you can't fall Flavian. I mean, he, you know, 99 times out of 100, it's a perfect ride. This one uh, probably would have wished to have been a little closer, maybe got gotten started a little earlier. But look, take nothing away from two Emmys, ran the race um, that you would expect given the setup. And again, credit to James Graham. Spectacular yeah. ride. Uh, we'll get to Pratt in a moment. The, the Daily Racing Forum wrote a piece about him that was just like, he's the greatest ever. And we'll talk about that in a moment. He kind of just missed on a heavy favorite there. But there's one other name I just want to bring up. Dan has a, as a as I've gotten to know Dan through the years, there's like a barn of his favorites. And one of them was in this race. Zulu Alpha was in the race and did not show up for you, Dan. This Bodie Meister, Zulu Alpha. There's a few of them that's like, I know they're Dan's horses. Like you should have your silks on their horses. Well, yeah. I mean, typically if if I hit for a lot of money with them, they become yeah. my horse. So um, mm. yeah, yeah. Zulu Alpha, maybe, um, you know, a, a little past uh, his peak and uh, his prime. Um, and, you know, look, uh, th this is a tough field. Anytime I see domestic spending in a field, I'm assuming that I'm, I'm playing, you know, an exact in the race, looking for the horse finishing second. Um, it was a, you know, it was, it was a fairly, you know, stout field of, you know, for, for what it was. Um, and of course, you know, with, within the backdrop of, of it being, you know, in all likelihood, the, the end of, you know, the, the last grade, you know, grade one race at, at Arlington park, yeah. um, you know, it was pretty, it, it was pretty somber. It was like a somber thing to watch. You know I mean? It just, it was just sad kind of, kind of watching it all unfold like, that way. Yeah. Um, the decision was made by it's twin spires that owns the park and the decision was made to close down Arlington park. And there's been a lot going on there where the, you know, if you really want to get into the weeds of it, the Chicago bears are trying to leverage the city to try to get a new soldier field. And if they don't, they're threatening to move to that property, which wouldn't move the bears out of Chicago, but would get them outside of the city where they've been forever, whatever. But this has an enormous history and it is, I think you use the right word. There it is somber. It was sad to see this like that track burned down in 1985. It was rebuilt it was then listed by like Architectural Digest as one of the most beautiful racetracks in the country at the time. And things have changed through the years, but still. And then the idea that, you know, greater Chicago would not have, you know, this kind of venue to showcase racing in and around such an enormous market in the country. Um, all of it is it's really sad to see it kind of go. Yeah, there are a couple of really good uh, pieces in uh TDN, Thurber Daily News. Uh, if you get get some time, I would recommend checking out those pieces. Just kind of, you know, some some retrospectives and, um, you know, just 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 all this, you know, uh, kind of looking back at how we got here. Um, informative pieces really capture a lot of the the the, the emotion around. 
this this imminent closure. Um, have you, Brent? Have you ever been there? Have you ever been to Arlington? I have never been to Arlington Park. Um, yeah. You know, because in the racing cycle, very rarely have they had the massive event take place there, and I always end up at you know all the major events outside of Maryland and New York. You know, because regionally it's close for me. So no, I haven't been there. Yeah, I, I you know, so I, I went. I went twice. I went once as a fan, just visiting one of my buddies in Chicago, um, and. I just remember walking in the first time thinking like, this is like a, like an upscale, like outdoor market, or it, it, it looked like, like just, you know, this, 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 this upscale, like garden or, or just, it was just, it was just beautiful. Like everything it had, like, like the indoor space is like, like, like a mall and the outdoor space is like this perfectly manicured garden. Um, and it was just so fresh and so clean. And <laughs> as a New Yorker, I mean, without like taking shots at like, you know, and, and, and any track in particular, um, <laughs> but I will anyway. <laughs> specifically, like I grew up going to Aqueduct, and it's no look, you know, like hey, look, I grew up going to Laurel. It doesn't look like that. Look, you know, we're sponsored by Naira, Naira Betts. Right. Everyone knows that Belmont and Saratoga are are the crown jewels, right? Like, and then Aqueduct is not as well maintained, and so like you know, as, as someone who grew up going to that track to go to an Arlington. And just, you know, seeing the trees and this like lush grass and all the rest of it, I was like, this is spectacular. And, um, you know, what I remember from 10, 15 years ago also is like, you'd always have full fields and it was just really competitive, good racing. And then I went again a couple of years ago uh, when Bricks and Mortar won the Arlington Million. And again, it was like in the same like pristine condition. The track was was still just completely majestic. I remember just walking in again and being like, this track is incredible. Like, do people around here know, like, outside of the racetrack, do people in Chicago, like, know, like, what a spectacular place this is to spend an afternoon? So I think from that perspective, I mean, beyond, like, you know, again, the ripple effect, which which should be obvious of, like, you know, the horsemen that are stabled there, um, all the people who have worked there and who do work there in, you know, uh, in all sort of the, the core, the core structure itself and, you know, uh, in, 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 in the, and the concessions to, to, to the media and communications department to, you know, uh, people in the marketing and, and in the administrative offices, like thinking about all those people, it's tragic. And then again, thinking about what this beautiful structure is and it just being, you know, kind of, you know, the lights going out on it. I mean, it's, it's just, it's, it's a terrible thing. Yeah, it is. And, you know, I, I, the more I think about it, the more it's like, Look, having grown up with Maryland racing, I always know how tenuous it is if the Preakness, and this always comes up, if the Preakness were ever to leave the state and what that would mean for Pimlico and Laurel and for horsemen in Maryland and the sports, you know, survival in the state of Maryland. And it looks like that's finally been rectified and they're going to redo Pimlico and it's going to stay here. And I know that Maryland's going to be safe. And I look at something like Chicago and I go, I don't know how horse racing couldn't have thrived in such a giant marketplace. And it probably is because there was no major event that was ever forced to be there and become the kind of landmark thing of Illinois racing. And maybe that's where the ball was dropped through the years that they just didn't do something that like would command a lot of attention, a large crowd and value the marketplace. And then here we are where this land is going to get turned into a mall or whatever it's going to be. Look, I mean, in fairness, I mean, you know, are they, you know, they, they, they have a the secretariat sticks. Why? Because secretariat won a huge race there, right. um, you know, years ago. Um, they've had they've tried all sorts of um, you know promotions and 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 big big event days. Um, and you know, even you know, the other day, yeah, the Beverly D stakes. I mean, it, it's 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 another great great stake. Um, you know, that, that that generally attracts some really good runners. This year, Santa Barbara won it, who I think is probably going to be one of your favorites for the Philly and Mare Turf this year. So, I mean, I think that it, 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 it had, I think from within the sport, it has that, that allure and, and it over years has generated, you know, a lot of, you know, respect, right. It's just, it's one of those things where I think it's the market itself specifically. If it's either horse race, there's either a community around horse racing or you build a racing community around a track or you don't. And I just think for whatever reason, it just, it either, you know, I, I think it's just over the years, it just hasn't, you know, racing hasn't been able to sustain itself as an attraction, nor has there been a community outside of the racetrack that's yeah. been sustained, you know, w within the greater Chicago area. I think that's probably the issue. And we see it um, with tracks really um, all over the country. We've had, you know, multiple closures 
over the last few years, Suffolk Downs, right? Like we're talking about Boston. Like Boston. again, yep. you would think like, man, like, I mean, there should be, there should be interest in this, but when you don't have that, that real, you know, if you don't have a real racing community or community that's interested in racing around a track, mm -hmm. it's hard to sustain it. So I think, I think that's what we're looking at. Yeah, it is. All right. We'll get back into the racing next, including Flavian Pratt, who was in that Mr. D stakes and fell just short with the favorite uh, domestic spending. But first, bet your favorite tracks online with Naira Bets, available nationwide in 30 states. Naira Bets offers best in class HD live video and replays, online contests to compete with other Naira Bets players, exclusive promotions that give back more in expert picks and analysis. With an easy to use, free to download app, betting horse racing online has never been easier and safer. Sign up for Naira Bets now to earn a $200 sign up bonus with promo code ABR200. And welcome back to the Witter Circle presented by Naira and Naira Bets. I'm Bram Weinstein with Dan Torgman. So I read this piece by um, the Daily Racing Forum um, over the weekend where they're just kind of laying out the case that the best jockey in the country right now, they might be Flavian Pratt. Um, won the Preakness on Ron Bauer, which was, you know, an upset at the time. Uh, Ron Bauer has since has shown out pretty well since then, but still at the time was a surprise when he won. Just won the Saratoga Oaks re recently with uh, Con Lima. Um, he's winning for various different barns. It's not like he's riding all the great horses of one particular barn. He's riding for all these different trainers, these different barns, even though he's left Del Mar a lot, he's still the leading rider there. So the case got laid out that, I don't know, sounds like, uh, he might be the best jockey in America. <laughs> I mean, look, I, um, I I've had him up there for a while, sort of in my own personal rankings. I I've said for years now. I think he's the best or one of the top two or three turf riders in the country. I put Tyler Gaffleone up there with him in terms of turf riders. We've seen what Rispoli can do. Um, and then, you know, you know, when I think about some of the other, like, like the, there are other jockeys who get hot seasonally, right? Like right now at Saratoga, there's no jockey riding better on the turf than Jose Lescano. Uh, but I realized like, especially in reading that article that, um, you know, it's not just the turf. Like you mentioned, he's won some really big races on the dirt too. He won the Preakness. Let's not forget. Say what you want about it. He won the Kentucky Derby. Um, this this is a whole, this is a jockey who at 29 years old who has run who has won two of the biggest races in America. And then oh, not to mention, um, you know, he's also in just about every major graded stakes race now, flying you know across the country at Arlington this week. Um, and so, uh, I think there is a case to be made. Um, I was interested, interested to read that he's second, uh, right now in graded stakes winnings, uh, in graded stakes wins this year amongst all jockeys nationally, uh, behind Joel Rosario. So that's interesting. Um, you know, it's, it's hard to, to, to refute it, right? I mean, he's to a certain extent, I think a lot of folks, especially the people that we talk to being both here situated on the East coast. There is a bit of an East Coast bias. So because he's in California, maybe folks in our circle don't, you know, put him at that level. But I mean, I, I think we've seen him do it on the big stage on multiple circuits now. I don't think there's any question about his overall ability. Yes, he can dominate in California and then he can also travel to New York or Kentucky or Florida or, you know, Arlington and still win on a big race day. Yeah. I mean, it's funny, like you'll see certain jockeys will end up with certain trainers or certain barns, but mainly certain trainers, and they'll kind of ride that success like for a while there. And it's not to diminish anything Mike Smith has done. It's amazing what he's done, but he rode all these Baffert horses at the time when Baffert had these best horses in the country kind of going. He kind of rode that success of uh, same thing. Um, happened with uh, Victor Espinosa. He was riding all of those horses at that time. Prod is riding for all these different trainers and winning for all these different trainers and it's probably more ubiquitous than i'm making it sound but i think that's what's kind of amazing about what's happening really with him this year is that it's he's not winning on one horse or two horses out of the same barn he's winning with all these different trainers in all these different spots so either he's got incredible luck really good timing or an immense amount of talent it's it or maybe it's all of it i don't know who knows well you, you make a good point because like when you think about think about his breeders cup winners right obviously a battle of midway storm the court um you know he's riding for uh california based trainers out there peter and obviously um and uh you know richard mandela he's written for so he rides for all these like west coast trainers baffert as well 
And then now you see him getting on Chad Brown's horses. going yeah, or going Brad through. Cox or others. I mean, he's just right for everybody. I know it's, it's, it's kind of crazy. It's like they're all coming after him. He's picking the right spot. He's on the right horse and he's winning with them all in these different places. I mean, I don't know. He's LeBron James. I don't know. What's up? <laughs> <laughs> no, he is. He, he's he's really he, he's it's, it's a quick ascent, too, because. You forget, like, um, you know, he came to the U.S. initially uh, about 12 years ago when he was still a teenager, um, did sort of a soft launch of his career here. But really, it was more about establishing connections and building relationships and that sort of thing. Went back to France and then came back and was like, look, I'm going to do this. But that was only five, six years ago. Yeah. And to think about what he's accomplished in, 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 in that short time span, that, that he's only 29 it, it really is spectacular. I'm mean, excited to see, you know, what, you know, the next, you know, five, six years had in store for him. The European part of it can't be undersold either because most of the ones that do come over here grew up riding on turf races. Turf races are a big deal here, but they're not the big deal here. The dirt races are. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, like very rarely are we finding a European jockey that comes over here and can kind of do both, you know, and end up being really, really good at it. Like, Rispoli's over here. He's winning a lot on the turf. Not a surprise. You know, every time the Breeders' Cup rolls around, all these guys who win all these races over in England and France, they come over here and they try to steal the turf races in the Breeders' Cup because it's their specialty. He's been able to transition over. And that's really, I think, what's unusual about him, too. Yeah, no, there's no doubt. I mean, he's been spectacular. Um, you know, again, a, a lot of that success being on the turf. You think about the last 10 years or so, obviously, uh, Julian Leperu, Florent Giroux, yeah. um, two riders, um, you know, uh, you know, from France who come here and, and have mostly, you know, that that initial success on the turf. Now, Giroux is, is another case where you talk about Brad Cox. He starts riding for Brad Cox. He starts riding for Steve Asmussen. He's riding these really good dirt horses now too, and all it takes is having the good horses to ride. And you've seen the success that Giroux has had with Monomoy Girl, with Gun Runner, with with horses yeah. like that. And so, um, you know, I think that it's maybe you know it, it's our fault and and sort of you know and whatever sort of expectation we might have that they can't convert um, you know their style of riding to to be proficient on the dirt when in fact we keep being shown now time and time again that they can you know, ride just as well, uh, on the dirt. So, um, I think that's what we're seeing with, you know, Giroux being sort of an earlier example. Um, you know, and Leperu too. I mean, you know, look, I still, I, I still think Leperu is, you know, uh, you know, at his best when he's on the turf, but I mean, he could, he could ride a dirt race as well. And then obviously now we're seeing with Pratt, uh, you could do it on anything. We could ride on yeah. whatever you want. <laughs> yeah. So. Uh, all right, let's take a quick break. When we come back, um, it is time to get ready for the Fans' Choice Awards, which are coming up very, very soon. And we're going to get into my favorite category, Best Announcer. And I have a huge nominee that I would like to put in front of all of you to vote oh, wow. on next. Yes. But first, take a listen to this. No sport in the world brings the wins home like racing. It's one-of-a-kind, high-speed, high-stakes action. And Naira Bets takes you there. Place your bets and watch the races live from anywhere. With Naira Bets, make easy, secure deposits and promotions every day to earn reward points or cash. Download the Naira Bets app or visit NairaBets.com. All right, welcome back to the Winner's Circle with Dan Torgman. I'm Bram Weinstein. We're presented by Naira and Naira Bets. All right, year three of the Fan Choice Awards are coming. Last year, we got a little bit derailed because of um because of covid we had the live show that we taped out in delmar actually the first year and then um we couldn't do it again because everything got shut down last year so everything went online we'll see how it goes with old delta delta's gonna play nice by the time we get around to do with the fans choice awards but the one we want to start focusing in on today is best announcer right best announcer that's the one you'd like to talk about today yeah. So here's why. So as you mentioned, Fan Choice Awards, usually uh, the voting starts right after the Breeders' Cup. So we're looking at um, early November, early to mid-November, and then we announce the results in December. And the reason you vote in the Fan Choice Awards, obviously, aside from just expressing yourself, is because ABR chooses four people to win a thousand bucks. We just give a thousand dollars away to four people who vote in the Fan Choice Awards. So that's coming in November. But this year, for the first time, we have opened early voting, 
And the early voting isn't for the winner, but it's to give the fans a voice in who the finalists are. Because in years past, we've gotten criticism about, well, how come you didn't have this person as favorite TV personality as a finalist? Or how come you didn't have this racetrack as one of the best racetracks? So for four categories this year, the four most hotly contested categories, we've opened fan voting early so that the fans can choose the finalists. So we have a larger list to choose from. And the past two weeks, we had best racetrack food. We had best small to mid-circuit racetrack to show some love to some of those other tracks that have maybe gotten, you know, outdone or blown out of the water by like a Saratoga. Now, this year, they've got a chance to win a Fan Choice Award. Next week, voting will open for uh, best radio show or podcast. And this week, we're voting for finalists on favorite racing TV personality. And it's important to focus on the wording there because when you look at, at the potential nominees there, we've narrowed it down slightly because in years past, it was favorite racing analyst. Uh -huh. But there are a lot of people who consider themselves analysts who maybe fall just outside, you know, meeting some of the <laughs> criteria of what an analyst uh -huh. is. So what we've done is not to give short shrift to any of like the racetrack analysts, but they end up getting hurt a little bit by this. We um, are only including analysts that are actually on a cable or network TV racing broadcast. So you've got TVG, NBC represented, TSN in Canada rep represented, um, Fox Sports, of course, America's Day at the Races um, represented. Uh, but so, so the you know the paddock analysts from you know pick your track, you know Arapaho Downs is not in there. But um, TV, you know the TV personalities that we see on actual TV. Um, not within in house, like within the in you know in house simulcast feed, they're all there. So vote for your favorite one. We drop the link uh, in the comment section. Is there somebody at Arapahoe Downs who's being overlooked that you <laughs> want to talk about here? I I don't know. Um, I know okay. I know people there, and I love them, and they're great. Uh -huh. But for the purposes of creating a list that was manageable for people to actually narrow down to their final five or six which is what this process is about right now, we figured we'd give them the people that they're seeing most often, right? And those are the people that they're seeing on, on TV. All right. I don't know if you count them because I'm voting for you. As Steven Wido says, <laughs> Dan is the best. That's it. That's the message. And are you on this list, Dan? Can I vote for you? Do you count? Uh, th this, was your, this was your sleeper pick? Your, your yes. Pick? Yeah. yeah. I no, nominate you. Yeah, for two reasons. One, um, no one has come calling yet to, to get me on network um, or to get me on on you know TVG or, or whatever else. But I've seen uh, you do stuff on uh, on TV. Didn't you do stuff for Maryland? I swear, I took my kid to Maryland Million Day, and you were on TV that day. <laughs> I, I I get an occasional invite to host something. I'm oh. always up for doing it. Uh, but you know, this is regulars. We're we're, we're talking about the regulars uh. on the you know the the the, the actual day to day. Uh, handicappers and TV personalities, but there are a lot of good ones on there. I'd encourage anybody watching this to go check it out. Vote for your favorites. Um, you know, and we've had, we've had, you know, it, it's always kind of, you know, it's, it's a tight vote at the end of the year. Year one, it was Brittany Erton who won and she's yeah. spectacular. She's of course, TVG and NBC. She's on the list again here this year. So I'm sure she's going to do really well. Um, last year was a really tight vote. Uh, we had like, you know, Gabby Gaudette, we had, uh, Kate Bradar, we had, you know, uh, Maggie Wolfendale. Ultimately Maggie won, uh, won the, the final fan vote. So we've had two different winners in the first two years. Ooh. We'll see if anything changes, uh, in year three, or if we get a repeat winner. I like Lafitte Pinkai, mm. Randy Moss, and Dan <laughs> Torgman. Those are the three that I'm voting for. Those well, are the three. Two of them. <laughs> You can write me in if you want. I mean, I don't think we're going to have enough. I'm going to write you in. Yes, I'm going to write you in right now. And put it on the comment. Write in Dan. Hashtag write in Dan on the replay of this show. Oh, so I want I want you to win this award, Dan. You deserve it. Oh, well, thank you, man. I appreciate that. You're, you're a sweet man. Thank you. I appreciate that. I know I'm a sweet man. All right. Uh, that will do it for us this week. Uh, we'll be back. Oh, Saturday. You want to tell everybody what Saturday is? You want to talk about the live stream Saturday yeah. real quick? Saturday's a big day. Uh, it's a uh, road to the uh, Longines Classic Breeders' Cup Live. Uh, me, you, Matt Bernier, uh, Ren Carruthers will be live for, who knows, 
we say an hour and a half maybe, but who knows? You know, it could be two, three hours. Uh, we're, it's going to be the Pacific Classic, uh, which of course is the winning you're in for the uh, Long Jeans Classic, and also the Del Mar Handicap. Big day of races. Last year on this weekend, we hit like I think a $5,000 pick five between us. Um, so hopefully we can recreate that. Yep. Sounds good. I'll see you there. Have a good week. I'll see you on Saturday. This has been uh, the Winter Circle. We're presented by America's Day at the Races, the official live broadcast partner of Aqueduct Racetrack, Belmont Park, Saratoga Racecourse, and Tracks Nationwide. For Dan, I'm Bram. We'll see you next week. 